Well, it's so good to be with you. You can be seated this morning. I'm just delighted to be with you today and uh, just love this church, appreciate this house so much, and uh, have just come to uh, find a quick connection with your pastors. Pastor John and Robin have been so uh, precious to me, warm, welcoming to me, and sometimes you meet people and it's as if you just pass the preliminaries. Amen. And it's like you just have known each other all along, and I've certainly felt that way with them. And then, of course, Bishop Anne, such a delight and an honor to meet her and appreciate so much all that her ministry has done in the earth all these years. And so for a, uh, you know, chick preacher, as I like to call myself, uh, you know, to meet Bishop Anne has just been such a joy, and, and she's really just taken some time and shared some things and parted some things into me in the time that I've been here, and I so appreciate that. How many of you are thankful for your home church this morning? (laughs) Praise the Lord. Well, I have a running theory about the Rock Church, and maybe you all can help confirm this or not, but my theory is that if the entire body of Christ somehow has a connection to Rock Church, somewhere in their history. I'm convinced there's not a believer on the earth that if you hear their story long enough, you won't find out. If it wasn't them, somebody in their family line, come on, pass through Rock Church, hello. And uh, what a tremendous legacy. But then you know what I believe that means is that your harvest is great, Rock Church. I said, your harvest, come on, you got seed in the ground for multiple generations now. Your harvest is great, and your harvest is for such a time as this. Amen. Well, I certainly have that, and I've kind of been waiting to share this, but um, I was just uh, excited to come because when I was a young girl, I gave my life to the Lord. You know, as a young girl, I grew up in a Christian family, you know, a typical church kid, but I remember making a decision at a young age to invite Jesus into my heart, you know, and, and have that moment. And, uh, and I really developed a, a working relationship, a very personal relationship with the Lord, even as a child. I remember being able to hear his voice very clearly, and a good reason of that is I had a tremendous children's pastor, and our children's pastor taught us to have a relationship with God, and uh, my children's pastor just happened to also be my uncle, and uh, my uncle, um, his name is Jim Peterson, and uh, when he was a young man, he graduated high school, joined the Navy, and of course, when he got out of the Navy, where do you think he came? He came to Virginia Beach, and he had just gotten saved. Someone had led him to the Lord on that ship. And so when he got out, he said, where do I go? And they said, you got to get to the Rock Church. And so he came to the Rock Church and found out there was something called the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And he got filled with the Holy Ghost and then stayed here for an amount of time and really got discipled. And he attributed his ministry. He's ministered literally to hundreds of thousands of young people, uh, still pastoring an awesome church in northern Kentucky. But he attributes his discipleship and his relationship with God to what the Rock Church put in him. So I join the ranks today (laughs) and say, Thank you. Amen for that deposit and uh, what was done. And you know, this is kind of a funny side note. How many of you believe that God's just always weaving a tapestry of destiny, isn't he? And, uh, and so when I came here for the women's conference last year and Pastor Robin and I met and connected, we found out, interestingly enough, that we have the same birthday. And we thought that was so funny. We were both born on January 30th and you don't really meet a lot of people that were born on January 30th. We both commented on that. And wouldn't you know that my Uncle Jim's birthday is also January 30th. Isn't that something? You say, what does that mean? I have no idea, (laughs) but I thought it was worth mentioning. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Did you bring your Bibles this morning? Hallelujah. Well, if you would, go ahead and open up to the book of Ephesians. And as you do, I want to mention just a couple of tools that I brought with me that um, I believe will be a help and a resource to you in the purpose of God for your life and what God's called you to do. And uh, just last year, uh, I was so privileged to receive a uh, publishing contract from Whitaker House Publishing and released my second book. It's called Calling, Understanding Your Purpose, Your Place, and Your Position. 
And I wrote this because I found out it's one thing to know God has a call on your life, but then all the details really are caught up in the purpose for your call, where does your call function, and the position for your call, and how do you discover all three of those. So this is a real easy read. It's just 12 chapters, but I believe it's a significant tool that will help you in the next step. Somebody say next step. Come on, I believe in taking next steps uh, in the path of your destiny. So that's out there. And then we also have a 21-day destiny devotional. The Lord dropped this in my heart one day, and I think you'll appreciate this. He said, Jan, I want you to start speaking to your day before your day can start speaking to you. And I thought, man, that sounds strategic. You know, I like that. And so I began to write out this 21-day devotional where I would declare things over my day, very specific. And so we made that a tool. Well, don't you know that all those women at the women breakfast bought all my devotionals? But we have a digital copy. And so if you want it downloaded to your smart device or your iPad, um, you can just buy the download card, and uh, that'll be a blessing to you. You can start speaking to your day. And then I'm just going to mention two series just because they sort of tie in with the message that I have this morning. I believe I'm here on divine assignment. Amen. The Lord spoke to me clearly about this morning. And these two words really tie into that. This is a brand new uh, two-part series. It's called Brand New Doors. How to recognize and navigate new doors of opportunity in your life. And the second one is Courage Under Fire, Grace Under Pressure. Come on, how to live by faith in a pressurized world. How many of you know we need that today? Praise the Lord. So those are out there, and uh, I pray those will be a blessing to you. I'm going to set those there. Did you find Ephesians? Praise God. Well, let's pray over this this morning. You know, when the Lord called me to what I'm doing today, I've I've been serving the Lord full-time in the ministry for 22 years now, Um, and I started when I was about five, and that's why I'm so very, very, very young, and um, I will not be offended that you laughed at that, so. But when the Lord called me to um, this mandate— this precious mandate that he's put upon my life, which is to speak to the plan and the purpose of God, to awaken destiny within the heart of a person, to speak to the plan of God upon a church, a ministry, to speak to the plan of God upon a city, a state, a region, even the nations. And how many of you know that you don't start with nations, but if you're faithful, come on, eventually he'll take you there. Amen. And I've watched him be faithful in that uh, over the last 22 years. Um, I've had the privilege of going door to door and ministering one-on-one, ministering to teenagers. I've had the privilege of holding nationwide crusades and meeting with heads of state, presidents of nations, and bringing the word of the Lord. And really, all of it just winds up being whatever it takes to move the kingdom of God forward. Amen. But when he called me to this mandate, I said, Father, I give you my yes, but I'm just saying this, I never want to stand to preach just to preach. I said, what I'm asking you to do is to always position me in the right place at the right time with a word in due season. And I said, God, if that's what you're calling me to, I'm all in. And so I've really sought the Lord, contended uh, for that to make sure I'm in the right place at the right time. And so I say all that just to say, Rock Church, I believe heaven is never caught without a plan. Amen. And, uh, And so that means then that heaven has a plan for this morning. And uh, I believe we're going to get everything God has for us for this morning. And I believe he's going to speak to the season you are in as a person, the season you're in as a husband, wife, as a family, the season that the Rock Church is in, and even what God's doing in the earth. And it's going to answer some questions for us today. Come on, it's going to move us forward. Amen. And uh, we're going to see God at work in our midst. So let's just agree in prayer on that. Can we do that? Father, we just thank you all for your wonderful presence that's here. Thank you, God, for all of the faith, the stamina, the prayer, the strength, the endurance, 
that it has taken to establish this house. Father, we thank you for such a time as this that you've called us into. And Father, we thank you that you have next steps for us to take. God, you have answers that we need to hear. You have things that you have to say to us today. And Father, we make a declaration that we have eyes to see and ears to hear what you are saying to us. Father, we thank you. And Holy Spirit, we give you permission to invade the privacy of our heart, to move us into position for all that you have for us for this time. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Well, church, before we look at this verse, I want to make this statement, and I believe it'll be one that you'll find it easy to agree with. And that is that God is never settled with where we are. God's always moving us forward. Amen. The plan of God, we could say, is progressive. And that makes sense because God is progressive by nature. And this should really speak to our heart because what it should tell you then is that you're never going to reach a point in your life, and you're certainly not there right now, where Jesus the Son is going to look at God the Father and say, you know what, where she's at, where he's at is good enough. We're just going to leave them right there. We're just, we're just going to let them finish their days out right there. No, God is never going to settle on you or I, is he? In fact, have you ever noticed that it seems like you'll get to one particular place in life, and maybe God's really just pushed you and you had to break through some things, and you came into a new place and you feel kind of, okay, we got through that, and you're settled, and you think, whew, finally we can take a deep breath, and it's just about that time that the Holy Ghost starts knocking on the door of your heart, and he says, um, you can't stay here. I'm taking you somewhere. Am I the only one that's been there? Praise the Lord. And so God is progressive by nature. And really, we should know this because doesn't the Word of God tell us that God said, I'm always going to be taking you from strength to strength, come on, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. And so that's why, you know, we can be in one place of strength and go, well, this is pretty good. I'm stronger than I was last year. But God says, I, I'm glad you got here, but now I've got more for you. You can't stay here. Sometimes we, we push and we have to take our stand. And when we've done all else to stand, to believe God and use our faith to believe God. And, and we finally obtain that thing that we've obtained, been obtained for. And we go, oh, thank God we did it. And just about that time, we kind of go to sort of sit down and cruise for a while. Don't you know, the Spirit of God shows up and says, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you, I'm so proud of you. But you can't stay here. And you go, oh, God, I mean, I just got here. How many of you know that it's a good thing to be a part of the Rock Church, to come into a house where the presence of God meets you in the room? Come on, Sunday after Sunday. Oh, and, and it's not a stagnant move. It's a moving move where God's free to demonstrate himself. And it's so good. What a glory is in this house. But Rock Church, I stand before you this morning to say as good as it is, you can't stay here. Because God is taking you from one place of strength to a new strength, from one place of faith to a new place of faith. Come on, from one place of glory to a new place of glory. You ought to look at your neighbor and say, hey, there is more to you than meets the eye. Praise, praise the Lord. So God is always on the move. He's always doing something in our lives. And I want you to look here in Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 20. And it simply says this, And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom, somebody say in whom, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. Now, we should have look at verse 22 here. It says, in whom you also are builded together for what? For a habitation of God 
through the Spirit. You might have been saying to yourself lately, God, what are you doing in my life? God, what, God, what is going on? How many of you know that can be a really spiritual question that sounds very unspiritual? God, what is going on? What are you doing in my life? And no matter what set of particular circumstances that might be playing out through in your life, really the answer is the same for all of us. God is building a habitation of himself in you and through you. He's building a habitation of himself. When you gave your life to the Lord, you became a new creature. Come on. You became a species of being that has never been. Come on. The old man passed away. He made all things new. But now ever since that day you prayed that prayer, God through Jesus has been building in you and building through you a habitation of of himself in you, and it's growing, it's expanding. He's adding rooms onto it. It's getting wider. That's why some of you got into 2019 and you said, you know what, we, we need to do some things this year. Uh, maybe as, as husband and wife, you said, you know what, we need to start praying together this year. We need to make a decision that as husband and wife, we need to start spending time and praying over one another, and praying over our family. Why would God compel you to do that? Because he's compelling you to build a habitation of himself in your marriage. Maybe you decided as a family, you know what, we need to start praying together as a family. We need to grab up our kids as little as they are. We need to yank our teenagers out of their room. Come on, pull those earbuds out of their ears and say, come on, family, it might feel awkward. What We're going to pray together. Why are we going to pray together? Because God's wanting to build a habitation of himself in this family, in this house. You say, why is he doing that? Well, of course he wants us in fellowship with him, but church, in order for the world to see God. He's got to be on someone. In order for the world to see how good God is, he's, they've got to see his goodness on somebody. There's got to be something going on in your family, in your kids, between you and your spouse, where the world looks and go, why is there so much peace when I've got so much strife? There's, there's got to be, why, why is there peace in your health when I'm at the doctor every week, when most of my paycheck goes to the prescription drugs to get me off of the anxiety issues that I've got, and you're just cool as a cucumber, what's, what's that about? And you could just give them all kinds of answers, but really the truth is, it's because you've allowed God to build a habitation of himself and everything that the enemy de designs against you has one intention in mind. It is to attack the habitation that God is building. Rock Church, everything that God is moving you forward in, he is expanding the habitation of himself in your midst, in this plan, in this congregation, and all the places you touch around the world, as glorious as it's been, he's moving you to another place of glory. He's expanding the habitation of himself in the earth, and so the enemy would come to attempt to bomb what God is building. Everything he brings, you mean everything, everything he brings against you is because there is a power and authority that trumps him every time, and it's when there is a habitation of God in the earth. Hallelujah. And so what, what is God saying through this? I believe he's drawing our attention this morning to what has been going on in our lives, saying at the same time that God is expanding my vision, there seems to be such an onslaught of the enemy, and it's all to shut down the work that God is building. 
So how do we confront this? Because the truth is that some of us are sitting here this morning, and when we look back at some places where God has instigated a building, and we've experienced the onslaught of the enemy bombing what God is building, we discover that although we're still here and we're still standing, many times there's been a breach. There's been a breach. A breach is defined as any place where there is a crack, a rift, a fracture, a space, listen to this, that brings separation. And the number one tool that the enemy will use to cause a breach in your life, in what God is building, the first strategy of the enemy is to cut you off from your supply lines. Cut you off. So what's your supply line? In your house, it's your unity. Uh, Because where there is peace, where there is unity, you can't have strife. And so what does he do? He tries to find a way in to create a fracture, a rift, a break, a breach. What does the enemy do when he... When he shows up to attempt to shut down the expansion of what God is doing in your life, he looks for a weak spot to bomb so that a fracture can be made and he can infiltrate the ranks. But how many of you know that the enemy has never pulled a trick that God didn't see coming? Come on, a million miles away. Come on, doesn't the word say that many are the adversaries of the righteous, but he will deliver you from some of them? No. He will deliver you from the weak ones, but the strong ones might take you. No. He said he will deliver you from them all. Praise the Lord. So what does God instigate to counteract the attack of the work of creating a breach that the enemy does? Can I give you three things this morning? Three quick things. Number one, he will ramp up your prayer life in your time with him. Why? Because he will pull you in to the habitation that has been built while you are standing off attacks of the enemy to build on the expansion of his habitation in your life. So he'll pull you back in. That's why the word tells us the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Come on, when you are in a place where the enemy is trying to bomb what God is building and create a breach, that's when you need to ramp up your time in the habitation of his presence. Somebody say number two. Number two, you need to run to the word of the Lord. You need to run to the word of the Lord. You can build, church, you can build the word of God in your life. You can build the Word of God. You can get the Word of God in your mouth like that big old sword we saw out here today. I thought, I hope they put that somewhere safe because forget about chopping plants. Like, I'm concerned about my hair. It's short, you know. I mean, that, that's a serious sword, Pastor. I, that might be the largest sword I've ever seen. And, of course, it was made in Italy. I'm Italian, so I just wanted to point that out. But, uh, but you, can, you can build the Word can't you? I heard one minister say this once. He said, um, what you need to do is build a house of healing way before symptoms ever knock on your door. You build a house of healing. What do you do? You put that, you meditate that word day and night. You keep it so close that healing's just on your lips. You, You can build a house financially to stay economically sound. What do you do? You partner with God. You become a covenant with Him in Him with the tithe. And then you put your words on that action faith of your tithe. And you build a house of your financial security. Come on long before the enemy shows up. So we run to the presence of God, but we run to the Word of God. And can I just say this to you, church? You know, it's really not so much about how many times you say it as it is the position you say it from. Sometimes I think we we get a lot of wonderful believers caught up in just a fit of spiritual activity. That if we're honest, they're just wearing themselves out. 
If I just say it one more time, if I, if I just get up earlier, if I just do this, if I just do that. And I believe we should put action to our faith. But church, can I say that what gives it power? It's not your spiritual behavior and your spiritual gravitas and the outward physical display as much as it is knowing who you are in Him and that you're seated in Christ in heavenly places. And so when I say it, and I say his word, I know the position I'm saying it from, and that's what gives it power to produce. Praise the Lord. So number three, what does God do to counteract the attack of the enemy when there is a breach? I want to share a story with you that highlights this so well, and it actually transpired around 1944, and it was during World War II. And um, one of the tremendous battles toward the end of World War II happened around the nation of Holland. And Holland came under attack in a very severe way in that there was a specific island that was part of the Netherlands, part of Holland, that came under attack. And this island was secured by four dams four dams. And the island was secured by four dams because this particular island produced 50% of Holland's food supply. And so all of a sudden in this specific battle, uh, the enemy came in and bombed this island. It's called the Welcheren Island. And they bombed this island so severely knowing that this was where their supply came from, and when they were finished bombing it, they had breached all four dams. And so, of course, the island began to flood. Not only did it cut off the food supply for an entire nation, but it also displaced 50,000 families. Now, remember what we said, the strategy of the enemy is to cut you off from your supply lines, to get you weak, where he created a breach. He wants to weaken you so that he can come in and take over. And the whole reason that he comes in to weaken you and to take over is so that he can displace you. Boy, we got a lot of people in the body of Christ out of place today. And I believe the Holy Ghost is on the move, getting them back in place. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But we ought to be wise enough in this day, church, that we know this is how the enemy works, and we see these things coming. And, um, and so these four dams, you know, they just got bombed, and this island started to flood, and so Holland is in a panic. And so they rushed in, and they did all that they could do quickly in and of themselves to try and secure the breach in these four specific dams. And they were able to stop the water from sinking it entirely, but it was already flooded in large part. And so they had done all they could do. They just couldn't get the water to stop rising. And it really and truly looked like all was lost. But then a day came. Somebody say a day came. Someday a day came when all of a sudden something beautiful happened. And that's the day that their allies showed up. This is the most beautiful story. Their allies showed up and and they came in full resource. Listen to this. The Americans showed up, and they came with Navy boats. They came with workers and materials to stop the breach. Great Britain came, and they brought equipment. They brought sandbags and clothing. The Swiss came, and the Swiss came with a very specific idea. They came, and they built barracks to house the over 2,000 workers from the ally nations that showed up to stop the breach. Belgium came, and they did a very interesting thing. Belgium came, and they constructed a, a makeshift railway to carry the workers and the supplies to all four dams so that the work could continue. And so right when it looked like all was lost, they had done everything they could do in their own strength, all of a sudden their help came, supply came in the face of allies. 
And the number three thing that God will bring in your life to counteract the work of the enemy is he will call up allies around you to add their supply to what God has called you to do. That's why it's so important that you not get displaced or cut off from the place that God has put you because the day's coming, church, when you're going to need to call up your allies around you and say, hey, I remember that the word says said one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. Come on, I remember that the word says that where two or more are in agreement. Come on, he is in their midst. I'm saying that you're placed in the body for a reason. And when the enemy shows up and tries to unleash all hell in your midst, we ought to know right away what he's there to do. He's there to cause a breach. But if we will take our place, we can stop that thing coming a mile away. Come on, if we'll take our place and say, you know what? There'll be no breach in my family. I I refuse to get into strife with you. I tuck myself in to the presence of God. You know, there'll be, there'll be no breach in my health, my finances, in, in my children. I'm going to just get in there, and I'm going to get the Scripture, and I'm going to speak the Word. I'm going to build a new edition of the habitation of God. In, in my midst. And church, when the enemy comes to cause a breach in the plan and the purpose of God, come on, you see it all through the word. The next thing he'll do is he will summon allies around you. And they will come in, and as the book of Ephesians tells us, they will come in and bring that supply. The Bible tells us that God is building a habitation of his spirit through his body, and that body is a body that is knit together. By the supply of the Spirit that each joint supplies. You see, if you pay attention when you're reading the Word, you catch God in these specific modes of operation that He does. And one of them is God does this incredible work of knitting things together. Psalms 139, I believe it is, says that he knit us together in our mother's womb. That work of knitting, it's, it's intricate. It's so intricate that once it's knit together, you can't tell one piece of thread from the other. And God not only knit you and I as individuals, but then it says that he's knitting us together in the body of Christ. He's building a habitation. When we see anything coming that looks like something that would cause a rift, create a breach, as men and women of God, I believe we are called in this day to stop the breach. Praise the Lord. I want you to look at this verse in eight in the book of Amos. Amos chapter 9. The Lord gives us a promise of this work that he does. In verse 11, it says, And in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, and I will close up. Somebody say close up. And I will close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up. Somebody say raise up. Raise up his ruins, and I will build it, he said, as in the days of old. Why is he doing all that? Verse 12 tells us that they may possess the remnant of Adam, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that does this. He said, even when the enemy comes to breach what I am building, I'm coming in right behind him, and I secure every breach. I stop every breach. I close every breach because you will not be breached. In fact, you will increase, and you will inherit the heathen. You will inherit the nations, and you will establish a habitation of myself in the earth that is isn't just compelled to stay within the four walls of a building on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m., but it will do the work that it was sent forth to produce, which is to make the kingdoms of this world the kingdoms of our God. I say, church, this morning that every breach is closed in your life.
I say that every breach, every place of fracture and rift is stopped in the name of Jesus. And I say he's calling you into a greater place of strength, a greater place of strength and glory, building a habitation of himself. He's calling you into a place where they find the word in your mouth to a degree like never before. And I declare to you, church, that your allies are summoned to your sides on the right and on the left. And they are surrounding you. And they are adding their supply of the Spirit. And what looked like devastation, God says, not only am I repairing the ruin, but I am bringing you into a wide place in the name of Jesus. Do you believe it this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, the enemy messed with the wrong group of people because the word declares that those that know, those that know their God, that are in intimate fellowship with him. I like one translation says it this way, that are in close working relationship. Church, there are some that know the sweetness of God and it's wonderful and we should. There's some that know the intimate presence of God and we should. But then there are those that know the workings of God, the workings with God, the collaborating with God. Those that know their God shall do exploits. I don't know about you, but that word exploits doesn't sound like peace-filled expeditions to me. (laughs) It sounds like there's a reason why it's called exploits. It might get interesting along the way. So church, let me just say this to you today. Don't get ruffled when things get a little interesting. You say, oh, well, you don't know what I've been through, preacher. I mean, it's been more than interesting. It's been crazy. Well, that might be true and and been there, done that. I'm right there with you. But you know, a woman of God taught me a wonderful principle years ago. She said, Jen, never give a crisis your respect. I didn't come to play here today. Never give a crisis your respect. I refuse to make a deal out of anything the enemy's doing. When I already sang this morning, he's under my feet. I will not put a light on anything you're working. If anything, I'll make a mockery of it. Why? Because I already been told the story about the day. When the enemy was throwing a victory party, you know, because they'd crucified the Lord of glory. And they were having a ticker tape parade down Main Street Hell. And all of a sudden, in the middle of his ticker tape parade, here came Jesus, my big brother. And he marched down Main Street Hell, looked them all in the eye. And he walked right up to their ringleader, Satan. And he stared him in the eye with all of the kingdom of darkness watching. And he looked him eye to eye with him trembling. And he reached out and he stripped him of all authority. And he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And then, come on, my big brother Jesus, your champion, it says that wasn't enough. Jesus got so bold and audacious, it said that when he walked out of hell, he made a show of them openly, triumphing in it. Jesus danced back out of hell saying, nana, nanny, boo, boo, I got you. And church, I don't think I have to tell you this morning that when Jesus walked down Main Street Hill, you and I were in him. When he stared the prince of darkness in the eyes, he was looking into your eyes too. He knows he's been whipped. He knows he's been stripped. And he's not going to find us sleeping when he shows up to try and cause some rift or create some breach or cause a fracture. We just look him in the eye and say, ha, 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 ha. We've got the name. We've got the blood. And we know how to use it. Can you stand to your feet this morning?